So let's say this is, oh, uh, okay, let's see, where am I? Yeah. Uh, this is one with a disk here, it's empty space, and again, uh, the two things can connect. Here I have two disks here, and there would be other ones that I forget, and this one is just uh, the dual way of trying to do things uh, <coughs> with nothing inside, sorry. Okay, and again, the, I mean, the slide up there says that unfortunately, if you try to minimize size among currents, <coughs> Uh, there is no general theorem that says that there is a minimizer, okay? Uh, in fact, even in dimension, so for two-dimensional sets uh, bounded by a curve, uh, the existence of size minimizers is not known at this time, okay? Right, and then I have a list of uh, partial results or uh, things like this, but uh, I think uh, I will skip some of it because otherwise I will be even more late. Uh, there is one little problem with this description still is that it likes orientation because currents like orientation. So Möbius strips are harder to get this way. They could be, mini I mean, you can suddenly organize a soap film which uh, it looks like a Möbius strip, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to model it the way that I exactly said, but you can use other things like currents with values where the coefficients are in a group. Uh, or you can think about currents modulo two, which in this case would be the true and it would work. But there might be more complicated pictures where you would have to think sometime before you know exactly what's the right model with currents, okay? So that's the second complication that I have here. And okay, I think I'll, yeah. Uh, and again, the, the, the typical game for trying to prove si existence of size minimizers is to use size plus epsilon times mass, because this way you can apply the compactness. I mean, the reason why the usual proof for uh, mass minimizing current does not work for size is that you could have a minimizing sequence whose size tends to a limit, but whose mass goes to infinity. And then the usual compactness results about currents don't apply because the mass goes to infinity. Okay, so one way to force it not to go to infinity immediately is to add epsilon times mass and make sure that it stays. Then you can minimize this problem, okay? And you can try to prove some regularity for the minimizer of this, this guy, try to prove that it does not depend on epsilon and try to go to the limit. Okay, but, but you know, so far only partial results anyway. Okay. Uh, last one, so since today is the day of Reifenberg, so uh, Reifenberg homology minimizer. So this is a, a very nice way of setting uh, the boundaries story. So it's not differential geometry anymore, we're talking about sets, uh, but then we're going to do a little bit of topological, uh, algebraic topology, sorry. Uh, so this is the definition of a set being bounded by a curve by Reifenberg. Unfortunately, you have to uh, work with Chech homology groups and not singular homology or uh, simpler things, but that's because it goes, I mean, this homology goes to the limit better. And you're going to say that a set is bounded, let's say, let's talk about the curve only, All right? So here's my curve. The set would be bounded by the curve. If the following thing happens, you look at the elements in the homology of a curve, Okay, so in other words, just think about the curve itself. Run, uh, you know, at speed one and once. Okay, you turn around. Uh, but now you try to say, okay, uh, good, but in my new set, E, that contains the set gamma, this curve becomes zero in the uh, correct homology class. Okay, and in this case, in the picture I've said here, yes, it becomes zero because you can even contract it to a point. Okay, so the best way, you know, I should say uh, the set bounds if I can contract the curve to a point, but I don't say that. Instead, I play it more clever and I say if the curve disappears in the homology of a set. This is Reifenberg's definition. Okay. And you try to minimize the Hausdorff measure of dimension two of a set that bounds the curve in that way. And uh, what's, so let's say, long story here. 
uh, Reifenberg prove it. Uh, so, sorry, homology goes with a group of coefficients. Uh, hom uh, Reifenberg prove it with one of a group of coefficients is a compact group like Z2. Uh, I think also another good thing to try is uh, R over Z, the torus. Okay. Uh, then, in some cases, I think there was a result by Depot that says that you could work with a homology uh, with coefficients in Z. I mean, people like to take co coefficients in Z, so that's okay. And finally, I think there is a result of Fong somewhere uh, saying that uh, any group works and uh, also probably more, uh, less smooth boundaries uh, than usually okay so this is good because there is a good I mean at least there is an existence result uh, it really represents lots of beautiful soap films so uh, it's very nice okay uh, probably by the end of a lecture probably by the end of a lecture knows I will give a hint of a proof of that but it's only going to be a hint it's still a hard theorem to prove and I, I was told that the original Reifenberg proof was even more horrible, but uh, yeah, okay, right. And I have a last one, uh, which is the one I like. Uh, so you're not supposed to complain uh, yet. Uh, so I'll talk about the sliding plateau problem now, and I'll try to give you the definitions because I will use it all the time, okay? Here we go. Uh, so far, I mean, it's a little late to ask questions about the past, but don't, again, don't hesitate because, yeah. Okay, so uh, the thing looks a little bit uh, horrible sin from here, but it, it should not be so bad. So we are, uh, again, we're giving a set uh, which would be, yeah, which is E0, which is here, okay. And we will try to minimize Rostov measure among deformations of E0. And I will have to explain what I mean by a deformation of a set E0. Okay? And also there is this boundary uh, curve gamma. Okay? So again, you start from a candidate and you try to look at all possible deformations of a candidate and the deformations will be obtained as in the following way. So there will be images at the end of a one parameter family of the deformations, if you want, of a set E0. So what's uh, with this thing? So again, uh, you have this one family of mappings phi t. They are defined on the initial set and they are mapped in R3, okay? Uh, everyone is continuous, right? Uh, X to T, uh, the mapping is continuous both in X, which is normal, and a one parameter family is always continuous. So that's the second thing. So here you're not shocked, okay? Uh, you start with the identity. Uh, you're not shocked also. You do that often for one family, parameter families here. And, there are, uh, and the main condition is, is this one here. Not only you deform continuously, but when some point of a set is on the boundary, it stays on the boundary, okay? Uh, it can move along the boundary, but it, you're not allowed to pull it out from the boundary. Uh, usually I like to say, you know, think about a cur uh, uh, shower curtain, right? You can move a curtain as, as you like, okay? But, you, I mean, you have to keep the upper part on the rod, maybe if you move it uh, sideways, but you don't pull it off the boundary. So that's the main condition here. Uh, right, this one. Okay, uh, the last one uh, was introduced by Armgren when he was given this definition uh, away from the boundary. And it's, it can be convenient, it does not disturb. So if you want, you, you can either drop it or keep it. Uh, so the last mapping, you assume it's Lipschitz. But you never assume bounds on the Lipschitz nest, it's just, it's just Lipschitz. Okay, so that's, again, that's a deformation of a set. And what I have in mind is exactly that, you have this set. You move the points of a set in a continuous way, and you just make sure when a point is on the boundary that it stays on the boundary. Otherwise, you do what you like. Okay? No question about that? It should, yeah. Uh, we'll use that a lot so it's better if it goes slowly. Okay. And I have a certain number of, uh, I have a certain number of comments. And I will give you give them to you in disorder, 
but uh, anyway, so again, there was this last condition about Almgren, don't pay too much attention to it. If you were playing with currents, it would be good because it's a way to say that you can take a current and push it by the last mapping phi one to get another current. Whereas if uh, the function mapping is not Lipschitz, it's harder to define. But let's forget about currents for some time, okay? The second remark that I could do is that here I've been insisting on the fact that it's really a continuous deformation. Most of the time you don't need to say that because you could always, given the initial map and the final map, extend the one parameter family by just convexity. So in some cases uh, you can do that, so that's the reason why uh, you don't see the one parameter families in some definitions. Uh, here I think it's better to have this one parameter family. And it's important here because there is a sliding boundary here. So you want to make sure that even if the final uh, guy is on the boundary and the initial guy is on the boundary, you want to, to make sure that the point stays on the boundary along the deformation. And that's maybe not going to be satisfied if you just extend linearly between the zero time and the one time one, okay? Uh, there is, so the plateau problem that corresponds to this is just you take this initial set E0 as you like and you look for the deformation of a set which has smallest Rostov measure. That's a simple question. So in other words, you define the class of your initial set E0 and you try to minimize in the class of deformations of this set, Rostov measure, and this is the plateau problem, okay? And it's a plateau problem that depends on the initial condition, but that's okay because you know, you could even say that SOAP does something like this, right? You have some initial configuration. SOAP try to retract on something with small boundary, so that I'm happy with. Uh, it's, it seems realistic to me, but I don't know if it's really that realistic, but anyway, it sounds uh, fine. It looks simple in the sense that I don't have to know about al algebraic topology or current to set the question. The question has a bad problem with it is that for it too, there is no general existence theorem. So we would also have to prove existence theorem, okay? And the last comment that I'm supposed to make, I think, is uh, you might be disturbed by, you know, I have to give you an initial set E0. Uh, I, I claim this is nice. I mean, it means that you might have, I mean, there, there were examples that you've seen before where Given a boundary, there are a few different uh, solutions to Plato's problem. And here, the few different solutions would be obtained by different initial values, and that makes sense. Okay. Of course, the best way to define an initial value problem is to look at the SOAP film, take this SOAP film as an initial value, and then you win. Right. But, okay. Uh, and this is essentially my, uh, the end of my overview on plateau problems. So there are many of them. And I claim the more related to soap films are the ones that, that are not solved. Okay? Uh, except in dimension one. Right. Okay. Plan for the future. Uh, <coughs> so far, uh, and then I, I should look probably so that I, okay. So uh, there are two things that I try to do in these lectures. A certain number of them is going to be giving you proofs. Uh, this is because I'm sort of tired of giving lectures where you know, I show you these bubbles and I say there is a theorem behind the bubbles. Okay. And, but I will cheat because it's not always so easy to find uh, proofs. So in fact, what will happen is that I will be able to give you lots of proofs, but they will always be the same. So there will be a hero, the hero is the federer fleming projection theorem. So I will, will be spending a lot of time on the projection, on the federer fleming projections, okay? Right, so that's the general goal. And since I don't want you to stop at uh, the situation of maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I will try to describe a little bit what happens at the boundary. So the goal, of a, uh, the goal of a lecture should in principle be try to describe the way a soap film is attached to uh, its boundary when the boundary is a curve, okay? 
and this one, uh, this story is this story is fairly new in the sense that there was maybe some years ago a first attempt of descriptions of, of all possible uh, singularities, but it's, I, I don't think it was so serious an attempt. Okay, but I don't have a complete solution either. So okay, right. right. So that that would be the goal. So anyway, what I intend to do is give you more definitions. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, then. Uh, try to talk about the first regularity properties of uh, soap films. I will call them minimal sets or almost minimal sets. Uh, and then uh, talk about uh, the, so of course here I will give you statements, then I will introduce Federer Fleming projections. I will use them to essentially prove those things here, to prove that cost of measure along, let's say for instance, uh, minimizing sequences uh, would be uh, correct minimizing sequences uh, would be lower semi-continuous. Uh, then there is a main ingredient uh, for minimal surfaces and the such, which is the monotonicity of density. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about limiting theorems. Uh, so if you take a limit of minimal sets, easy to minimal set. It, it had better, but you have to prove it. Uh, and again, the ultimate result in that respect at the interior is Jean Charles' theorem that says that uh, the soap bubble that you've seen before cannot be worse in terms of uh, regularity. Okay. And again, then I'll talk about boundary regularity in your curve, and I wanted to give uh, uh, an idea of how you could prove existence uh, following a construction of Fevrier, but I don't know if it's going to be possible but I'll try to put it in the notes. Uh, there is a last thing that I uh, maybe should say, uh, which I said before in the slides, but I forgot. Uh, it's important for me to have not only the minimal, uh, good descriptions of a minimal sets, but to also have a description of the almost minimal sets. So for me, what is an almost minimal uh, set? So we'll see a definition. The definition will not be very interesting. You take the definition of a minimal set, you add a little mistake somewhere, and you say, okay, fine, that's, that's an almost minimal set, okay? Uh, but I think it's interesting in the sense that, you know, for instance, soap bubbles I would like to be able to describe correctly, and soap bubbles are not minimal, they are almost minimal, okay? Or, you know, imagine uh, 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 that some extra force is applying uh, to my soap film, uh, I would like to still have a description of a soap film instead of saying everything destroyed uh, as soon as I left the minimal uh, set setting. So f for me, it's important to be able to talk about almost minimal set. Uh, there is another way, which is it, from time to time, it will allow me to cheat because uh, minimal sets, they probably have some r nice rigidity properties and it might be very hard to describe exactly what minimal sets are. Almost minimal sets don't have this rigidity, so I can come up with a theorem saying, you know, the best theorem for almost minimal sets is that, for instance, they are C1 plus epsilon curves. And it's true for almost minimal sets, because I, you know, a C1 plus epsilon curve, it is almost minimal locally. It's not true for minimal sets, and this way I, okay, this way I don't have to solve the hard problems about minimal. And I'll just content myself of saying it applies to a more general setting and it works, right? But uh, this joke uh, uh, being put aside, for me it makes sense to allow the most minimal set. And I'm saying this because there are ways to deal. So for instance, one of the nice ways to deal with minimal sets is to talk about uh, stationary variables and things like this, okay? And then there is the next stage, which is very false, for which the first variation uh, is a measure or something like this. And this looks like a general class, more than just the first variation is zero or something like this. But uh, when you think about it, it's usually sort of strong as an, an assumption. It's really being close to minimal. And I think this sort of thing is a little bit too close to minimal. Here, uh, we'll be playing with our hands. Uh, is it a hint? <laughs> uh, we'll be playing uh, with our hands uh, to some extent. Okay, since I don't know 
it's safer here because otherwise I'll have to put my uh, password again. Okay. So again, I mean, almost minimal sets make 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 sense in this uh, this business. Okay. Uh, I still so let's say I know I will be a little late. So I think, although I expected this to be the last minutes of a lecture, I will still inflict you the definition so that it's done with for next day. All right. Okay. Right. And anyway, you're not going to be too shocked. Uh, so okay. So. Uh, here I will do it without the boundary first. I will do all, all the proofs without the boundary. And from time to time we'll say, oh, by the way, this proof works also when there is a boundary. Uh, when there is a boundary, you just have to do more complicated proofs, but they, the idea is usually the same. So I decided to do it this way, okay? So no boundary. Uh, competitor for a set in a ball is just a set, which is the image, it's here, uh, by mapping phi. And again, uh, here the mapping phi is essentially the endpoint of my deformation before. Okay. And usually I ask it to be leaf sheets. And again, uh, I ask this thing here, uh, which says that outside of a given ball, I don't change anything. And whatever I change inside the ball, I stay inside the ball. This is <coughs> the definition of a competitor for the set. Uh, e inside the ball B, okay, all right. Now you don't recognize the previous definition because the previous definition was more complicated because I wanted to include the boundary set. Uh, and but here it's the same again because given this phi here, if you just interpolate linearly between the identity and this set phi, you get a deformation. Since the ball is convex. Uh, the quantities, the, the, all the relations are going to be satisfied in the meantime. And since I don't have a boundary to take care of, I don't have to be careful to check that the point stays on the boundary. Okay. So that's the definition of a competitor. And uh, so I have this comment about sliding competitors and uh, an almost minimal set, again, plain, which means no boundary around, is exactly given by this definition. Okay. So I just give the definition here and stop. Uh, so the set is better than any of its competitor in the sense that it has less Hausdorff measure, except maybe a small error, which is here. In this here, I have this scaling, which is r to the d, and some function of r h, h of r, that tends to 0, which tells you the size of errors. So it's just a function that tends to zero that's given in advance. I call this the gauge function and it satisfies, I decided I think to take uh, something non-decreasing from time to time, even require continuous, but uh, okay, tending to zero and so on and so forth. Okay, so again, an almost minimal set is a set which is essentially better than all competitors in any bolt. And that's, uh, that's it, okay? And think ag ab about it as being some sort of a Dirichlet condition given by the set itself. So the set is standing, maybe it goes to infinity, but whenever I pick a ball, I cannot improve inside, given the boundary values there, okay? Okay, so I tried to play the watch as long as I could, but uh, yeah, it's maybe a good time to stop. No question?